so, uh, and I'm not anymore at Ecole Polytechnique, but Ecole Normale Supérieure, but besides these Sorry. details, uh, I'll be speaking about uh, high dimensional learning data analysis. And uh, I'll try to present the basic problems, but also some uh, very interesting advances that have been occurring for the last five to 10 years in relation with uh, deep networks, which are raising uh, pretty fascinating mathematical issues. And also specific work uh, of people in the group at Ecole Normale Supérieure, and there is a whole group of people that I'll be mentioning uh, on the way. So uh, let me first begin uh, with the typical problem that, that we're facing. And I'll begin, uh, for example, with a problem of image classification. So uh, in classification in general, uh, you typically have a very high dimensional vector x. So think, for example, of x as being an image, in which case there is let typically a million pixels. So it's an element of a space of dimension one million. And in classification, what you want to estimate, approximate, is a functional f of x, which associates to your data, for example, a label. So in the case of image classification, for example, the label here corresponds to anchors, Joshua trees, beavers, lotus, water lily. So the big, big difficulty of that is that you are in very high dimension and you have to estimate a function in very high dimension. So what do you have to do that? You have examples. So a set of xi, which are example of images, for example, and for each of these images, you are given the label. So the value of f of xi. And now the problem is you have a new x and you have to compute f of x. So as you can see, one of the big difficulty is due to variability. Within the class of anchors, there is a considerable variability, same for Joshua trees, beavers, and so on. And this variability is intrinsically due to the fact that you are in very high dimension. So that will be, again, the root of everything. So let me give a very different examples, which are issues of uh, audio classification. So in, for example, here you have a sound coming from uh, accordion and yet a completely different sound. You have to recognize that it's the same instrument despite the fact that you have a huge variability within the data, which is typically, again, several million points. So if the problem is instrument classification, you want to find that the second sound is much closer to this one in some sense than from these two others. Now, you may be asked a totally different question, which is, what's the music content? And if the question is, what's the music content, an accordéon and a violoncelle, cello, may be much closer from the point of view of this question, if you don't care anymore the timber and what instrument is there. So, the big difficulty is that we will be facing problems of classification of very, very different sorts. And the question will be how to prepare yourself to answer that kind of questions. The third class of example I'll be looking at is physics. Can we learn physics? Learning physics in this framework means you have x which describe the state of your system. f of x here, think of it as being the energy functional. So if you can compute the energy for any state, you can access the forces by computing uh, the derivatives. So you have access to most of the physical properties of your system. And the question is, can you learn this physical, prop uh, this, uh, physical energy functional without any prior information or very little prior information besides a certain amount of data? So x, for example, may correspond in the case of astronomy to the distribution of masses in, let's say, in a galaxy, or if you go to the infinitely small, it may correspond to the distribution of charge, let's say, in a molecule. We'll look in particular at the issue of quantum chemistry, and I'll be showing that indeed it's possible to do that kind of learning, which gives a slightly different look at how you can approach physics. Okay, so why are these problems so difficult? And the only and simple reason is again related to dimensionality and the so-called curse of dimensionality. So what's the problem? If you look at the problem from a slightly naive point of view, you can view this problem as a simple interpolation problem. 
you know for a certain number of xi the value of f of xi, you have a new x, the immediate idea that comes to mind is to say, let's look at all the points which surround x and try to interpolate the value of f at x from the values in the neighbors. And that will indeed give you a good approximation if f is regular and if you have close neighbors. And that's the problem. The problem is that you will never have close neighbors. So why you will never have a close neighbor? Let's look at 0, 1, a cube, 0, 1, in dimension d. Suppose, for example, you sample this cube at a distance epsilon. How many points would you need to cover your cube? So obviously the number of points is going to grow like epsilon to the power minus d. Think of epsilon as being 1 over 10. 1 over 10 is not very small. d being 100, which is pretty small. So 10 to the power 100, this is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So there is no way you'll be able to sample your cube, especially given that d is not going to be 100, but it's rather going to be 1 million or even more. So you have to think of your data as being completely isolated point in your space. And so you have a very, very coarse sampling. And you can see it from the fact that, so that means that for any x, you will have no xi which is close, as measured with a Euclidean norm. And you can see these belongs to the same class, but if you subtract these images, obviously that gives you no information about the class. This one and this one may be much closer than this one and this one, okay? So the problem you are facing is trying essentially to learn an appropriate metric. You are in a situation where your data, let's suppose, for example, here you have two class, the blue and the red points. They are going to be completely uh, spread in your space. There is no obvious order. On the other hand, because you do have a classification problem which tells you that these blue points and red points belong to the same class, you know that there exists some underlying metrics, delta, such that the red points are closer one to the other than the blue points. So the typical approach in learning will consist in trying to find a representation, so a mapping phi, such that by miracle, once you are in this new space age, so think of phi of x as being a big vector of descriptors. x is your original data, and now you represent your data by a set of features, but typically a huge amount of features. And what you hope, naively, is that in your new space, a simple Euclidean distance will give you a good estimate of this very complicated similarity metric over there. In other words, your similarity metrics is essentially equivalent to use Euclidean distance. So this is called a Euclidean embedding of a metric. You have a metric and you find a transformation such that suddenly in your new space, this metric becomes a Euclidean metric. Another way to view that, if you look at it from a probabilistic point of view, is that these points, you can view them as class one, class two being realization of random processes. These random processes are absolutely not Gaussian. And then when you map them in this space, they are going to regroup. The fact that you have a Euclidean distance which describes the notion of similarity means that you can essentially describe this distribution as Gaussian distributions. So by miracle, you found a mapping which suddenly transformed your distribution into a Gaussian distribution without losing the crucial information. Now, what is the crucial information? The crucial information is the ability to separate these two distributions and to find out that whether a point belongs to this or this class. Now, in that context, a simple classifier will just be a hyperplane to separate two Gaussians. So the final stage, which consists in finding the optimal classifier, may be computationally very heavy and require heavy optimization, but it's conceptually very simple. It's about fitting a linear classifier. The real difficulty which is behind all that is to understand how to build this feature vector, how to build this Euclidean mapping of this potentially unknown and complicated distance. Okay, so the problem of Euclidean, of uh, mapping uh, a metric into a Euclidean space is not 
new in math, in fact, has a long history. But the framework in which it has been solved are very different from the framework in which we are. So the first type of results that are typically well known and not so complex is when you know that your data belongs to some low dimensional manifold. Okay, so yes, potentially your data is in high dimension, but it may regroup in a low dimensional manifold. If that's the case, then the only thing that you need to represent is the manifold. And that means that you need to map your manifold, the metric over the manifold, into a Euclidean space. And that we know well how to do. You can build a diffusion metric, so basically over the manifold, which is given by the uh, um, Euclidean distance, basically it's a Gaussian function of the distance. And if you get uh, the Laplacian induced by the diffusion on this metric, you will get a mapping by computing the eigenvalues, a mapping into a Euclidean metric. Now, this case is very far from the situation in which we are. Why? Because the data does not belong to low dimensional manifold. That would mean that the data is driven by few parameters. If you take textures, if you take typical scenes, sounds, and so on, the number of variables is within tens or hundreds of thousands. So it doesn't belong to any low dimensional structures. The second kind of results that are well known for embedding metrics is when the number of points that you have to embed is specified let's say n points. In this case, you can build so uh, Euclidean embedding of essentially a graph in which the distances within the graph will become a Euclidean distance within your space. So these are standard results by Bourguin, Johnston, Linden, Strauss. Why does that not work in our case? It doesn't work because the metric is adapted to the points you are considering. If you have a new point, you have no guarantee that the metric will be appropriate for the new point. In other words, there is no guarantee that it's going to generalize. To guarantee that it's going to generalize, you need to have some kind of local regularity between your metric and the mapping. And that's where we are going into these not embedding of few points, but embedding of very high dimensional spaces with some prior information on the regularity. OK, now on the other front, on the other front, which is the uh, algorithmic front, a lot of things have evolved. So you have this very classic idea that has been developed since the 50s, which is to try to represent data with neural network. Now, these things have never really worked very well until the last five years, where very, very spectacular results have been obtained with these so-called deep network. In particular, two people have been working a lot around that, Yann Lequin and Jeff Hinton. So the idea is the following. You have your vector x, and a neural network, feed-forward neural network, can be described that way. You apply a linear operator, L1, which can be a convolution operator, OK? And then you're going to apply a nonlinearity to each of these value output by your linear operator. For example, an absolute value, a sigmoid, but something which is just going to act on each point individually. And that would be called a neuron. And then you iterate. You reapply a linear operator and your nonlinearity. And then you cascade until the point that you're going to get your representation phi of x. Now then on phi of x, you just apply a simple linear classifier. Now, you have a huge number of parameters of this network because think of each of these linear operators as being potentially freely chosen. So the number of parameters is the number of parameters in each of these matrices. Typically in such a network, it can be of the order of several billion parameters. Now, how do people learn these parameters. They have examples, and they measure the error of classification on their examples. And then they backpropagate the error in order to optimize the value of these, non -li uh, these linear operators. So these backpropagations are essentially gradient descent, no guarantee to converge, but the miracle is it does converge to a reasonable solution. 
not only it's a reasonable solution, but as I said, the results are very exceptional now. Uh, face recognition now is better done by machine than the visual system. You now have cars which are running in the streets, avoid people, stops and so on, so are driven without any driver because of that kind of visual system. Google apparently has over 25% of all his, their computational resources which are running on these things, which means more apparently than one nuclear plant is just used to drive that kind of thing. Facebook has all its product, whether translation, face recognition, uh, voice analysis for uh, Apple, are using that kind of technology. So it's not just an academic result, it's something which is very widespread. And the question is, why does it work so well? Somewhere these things seem to be doing some very reasonable embedding, in the sense that it works well. Mathematically, the questions are very open. And that's what I would like to speak about. So how come this kind of structure do provide appropriate embedding? And what I would like to show is that it's very much related to the ability to build invariant, but to build stable invariants over very large groups. And we'll see here relations with multi-scale transform and the natural reasons why these networks, uh, why it's very natural to build such networks. So we'll look at different kinds of applications uh, on images. I'll show applications also on audio signals, but I will also do relation, uh, show that that kind of structure brings a very different type of models on random processes. And that's in particular important when you are facing issues of modeling phenomena with very highly non-Gaussian processes, which often happens in physics, turbulence, but we'll rather be looking here in physics of issue of quantum chemistry. So I'll finish on learning physics and how all the physical properties potentially relate to uh, that kind of representations. Okay, so let me begin the analysis with a very simple case. Suppose you have an image of digit like that. You want to recognize that this digit is closer than this one, then, and these two digits are more far away. A very natural distance that has been analyzed for a long time in vision, but not only in vision, is the idea of deformation. You will say that these two digits are much closer because the deformation which goes from here to here is smaller than from here to here. So that's something which is used all over in classic mechanics. So you are going to look at deformation. So it's the action of a diffeomorphism which is basically going to warp the space to map this into this. And the natural distance that is going to come into it is to say what's the distance between x and x prime. If you deform x into x prime, you can measure the residue and you want to see how big the deformation is. And how big the deformation is, is basically the size of the derivative of tau. If tau is a constant, it's a simple translation. There is no deformation. The two objects are identical. If there is a warping, the maximum of the, the derivative of tau will give you the size of your diffeomorphism. So, in fact, here you put uh, 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 plus deformation d, d tau, but why not put a square or, or a square root or whatever here? Because, uh, because here in that case, we impose it to be proportional to the diffeomorphism. Uh, you can have square squares. That's for homogeneity uh, conditions. But why is, why is the diffeomorphism? Why would you? Oh, you could have a square on your diffeomorphism. This is a point of, we have it proportional to the diffeomorphism. Uh, you want stability. So, uh, what you really, the kind of properties that you will want, I will, I've put it that way because that's what people use. The kind of property that you really want is to have a metric which is Lipschitz continuous relatively to this. So the way you put it, you can put it many different ways, but the key property will be the Lipschitz continuity relatively to the diffeomorphism metric. So in particular, obviously, the representation is invariant to translation. An object translated is identical to itself. Now, 
why that kind of metric is much too naive. If you go in to really high dimensional structures, like for example textures, these two textures you'll consider them as being visually identical, although obviously you cannot deform one into the other. Which means that you also want, within these very high dimensional models, be able to define distances between realization of stationary random processes. And in particular, if two realizations are realization of the same, in that case, stationary ergodic process, then you'd like to say that the distance between them is very small. So underlying this problem is the issue of defining distances on non-Gaussian processes. And if you think of it in terms of representation, it will mean taking these processes, mapping them into a Gaussian process so that then a simple Euclidean distance will give you an appropriate measurement of similarity. Okay, so let me put here the list of property which we want. The first one is we want obviously something which is stable to uh, additive perturbations. In other words, phi of x minus phi of x prime should be bounded by x minus x prime. This is completely obvious. You want something which is invariant to translation, okay? An object and an object translated are identical, so if you take an image, you just translate it, you want that the representation of the translated image be identical to the representation of the original image. The real difficulty will be the stability to deformation. And what I want to show is that this property will imply essentially all the structure of these deep networks. What you want is that if you have a signal, whether an image, audio signals, and we'll see in more general cases, which is deformed, then you want that the distance between your representation of x and the representation of x deformed should be of the order of the deformation. If the deformation is small, the two signals should be considered as close. If the deformation is big, potentially, the distance can be big. Okay? Can you say uh, transfer, uh, of course, we should know uh, uh, it, but when you say translation, is it, for instance, if you have images, is it like, like this, or is it like you increase the scale? No, it's a translation of a U, so it's a translation, geometric yeah, translation. a geometric translation. That would be a multiplication by a constant. Okay. Yes, but, okay, but then you have issues with the fact that your images are finite. Here I'm in L2, I have no boundary, then you can go on periodic boundaries, but here I'm in infinity. I, I, basically, these are functions in L2, okay? Now, one of the very natural tools to deal with that kind of thing is to think of the Fourier transform. Why? Because obviously Fourier transform is unitary. The Fourier transform, if you take the modulus, is invariant to translation. Why nobody used the Fourier transform in recognition? it's not stable to deformation. If you slightly deform a function, the high frequencies are going to move very much, and if you compute the Euclidean distance on the modulus of the Fourier transform, they may look very different, although the deformation is very small, which is, of course, an issue which is well known in many problems in mathematics. Okay, when you have a problem related to instability to deformation, what you need to do is separate scales. You need to separate the variability at different scales, and the way we are going to do it here is by using a so-called wavelet transform. So the idea is the following. Your function, we are going to separate the information in different frequency bands with filters. The filters are wavelets. So you take a wavelet, psi, you dilate your wavelet, so this is a wavelet which is compressed or dilated. And in the Fourier domain, a wavelet, in signal processing term, you can interpret it as a filter. And when you dilate it, you are going to cover different frequency bands, okay? In signal processing, these are called Q constant filter bands. And then what you do is you take your function x, you extract the component within each of these frequency bands, this is also called littlewood pellet transform, so that date from the 1930s in math. And at the very low frequency, what you extract is basically the average. So you take your function, you separate components appearing in many different scales. 
And if you design appropriately your filters, you are going to get an energy conservation. That's simple to verify. Now, what about images? In images, we'll do exactly the same thing. The idea is that for an image to build up a stable representation, we'll need two separate scales. But in image, you also have orientation. So what you take is a wavelet, which is now a two-dimensional function. Think of it as a Gaussian modulated by a sine wave. You have the cosine part and the sine part. Then you dilate it, so you get your cosine part, which gets smaller and smaller. That's the wavelet. And then you change the orientation of the sine wave with a rotation, and you get wavelets with different orientations. Then you do the same thing. So in the Fourier domain, this is a wavelet, uh, a Gaussian modulated as a certain frequency. And then when you rotate it, you cover a frequency annulus. When you dilate it, you get all the frequency bands. So then you do the same thing than in one dimension. You make a separation in each of these frequency channels with a convolution with your wavelet. And you have the averaging of your, uh, of your function at very low frequencies. And same thing, you conserve the energy. OK, so what is that related to our original problem? OK, let me show you an example first before uh, arguing on that. So this is an example of image. These are, let's say, the detail at different orientations at very high frequency. This is the low frequency of the image. This low frequency is split again into details within different orientation and even lower frequency image, which is split again and split again. Okay? So that's a standard wavelet transform with the different component in different orientations. Now, the only component which is going to be invariant to translation will be this one. It's the average of the image. So all the rest is not. And that's the big problem. How to make everything invariant to translation? So let's look back at the problem. In one dimension, you have a function like that. If you want to make this function invariant to translation, and if you use a linear operator, you don't have the choice. The only thing that you can do is average. If you average over a domain, let's say, of size 2 to the j with a kernel like that, you're going to get a regular function, which is almost invariant to small translations, small translation related to 2 to the j. If you want it to be completely invariant to translation, you average from minus infinity to plus infinity. And wonderful, you have a quantity which is now invariant. But You've lost everything. And that's the issue when you build up an invariant. The difficulty is to make sure that your set of invariant are sufficiently rich that you don't lose too much information. And here, if you use a linear operator, the only thing you can do is get the average. OK, where did you lose the information? The information you lost are the high frequencies. OK, that's what you've lost. The high frequencies are very highly oscillating. So if you average the high frequency, you just get 0, nothing to recover. If you do the same strategy than in the Fourier, you kill the phase. So take the modulus. What you're going to get is an envelope like this. Now, this envelope is not invariant to translation. If x translates, the envelope is going to translate. How can you make it invariant to translation? You average. Let's average the envelope. If you average the envelope, now you have a new set of invariants. However, you've lost information. What is the information you've lost? Well, when you average the envelope, you lost the high frequencies of the envelope. And where is this information? You can recover by taking your envelope. You have the average of the envelope in red. And you can get the high frequency of the envelope by computing its wavelet transform. And what are you doing suddenly? You are cascading this operator. The wavelet transform each time computes the invariance, the average, and the next layer of high frequency coefficients. And that's how it looks like. You begin with x. First, you have your invariant by averaging. And then all the lost information in the next layer by separating into different scales. Now, each of these images, we are again going to make them invariant. You get an invariant here. And then the next layer of wavelet coefficients. These coefficients, these, how can you interpret these? The first layer of wavelet coefficient, you can view them as interactions between the different components of the image. 
because you send a wave and each component of the image is going to interact through this wave. These are interactions of interactions. Again, you average them with the next wave that transform. This is your new set of invariant and the next layer. And what you've built is a neural network. You need the nonlinearity in order to capture the remaining information. And now the question is, what's the property of these things? How come it can be useful for classification? So how did we build this representation that I'll call here a scattering transform? It's a scattering transform because you scatter the information through a very large network. You build it by iterating over a linear operator modulus. Linear operator modulus. Now, your linear operator preserves the norm. So if you take the modulus, it's contractive. In fact, you are just applying contractive operator one after the other. So the first result that you get is because you cascade contractive operator, the resulting operator, Sx, is going to be contractive. You contract, contract, contract. So the result is going to be contractive. The difference at a position x and y of the scattering representation is smaller than x minus y. So you get your stability. You can, in fact, prove that all the energy of your signal, and that's more subtle, is preserved by this environment. So the whole, exactly like a Fourier transform, all the uh, information is within the environment. However, what you don't have with a Fourier transform and any standard representation, you are Lipschitz continuous to diffeomorphism. And that's the key property. If now your signal is deformed, any arbitrary deformation. If you look your representation with a simple Euclidean metric, the distance within that space is going to be of the order of the deformation. And that will guarantee that whenever you have structures which are deformed, they will look similar, and you'll be able to classify them easily from that. So, and uh, just uh, a comment. Why do you need wave? Here you need to have a wavelet, because the property which is behind this stability is the fact that your transform has to almost commute. So the commutator has to be not too big, and that you can prove, essentially, you need scale separation. OK, let me show a first example that was developed by Joanne Bruna for digit classification. So the case of digit classification is a little bit ideal here, because two digits are similar, essentially, if they are either don't have the same position or are slightly deformed. So what you do is you take your digits. This is a well-known database of digits on which there has been hundreds of uh, of publications, you take your digit, you build up the scattering representation of your digit, and then you do a very simple, stupid class linear classifier. If you do that, you basically get the state of the art. If you look at the performance of these deep networks, they do almost as well. But what is interesting here is that they learn everything. Here, what did we say? We said, well, we know the source of variability. We know that the source of variability is due to deformation. So we don't have to learn anything. We know that the filters should be wavelets. So we just send wavelets, we get the representation, and we get the result. Here, they learn their filters. And that's the spectacular side. But of course, you need huge amount of computations, and the performance are almost as good, but not as good. And, and, and uh, are these uh, filters wavelet type uh, in some sense, uh, in average sense, or whatever? Uh, yes. So, in fact, if you look at the way they structure their network, they structure their network as a cascade of filter, in fact, to build up indirectly wavelets. So there is a, a lot of know-how when you build up these networks, they don't put the wavelet filter, but they structure it in such a way that the algorithm has to converge to something close to a wavelet filter. Let's look like the problems of random processes. So these are databases of textures. A QRT, this is a Berkeley database. We are going to do exactly the same thing. You take a texture image, you compute the re scattering representation, compute a linear classifier, and just do the classification. So a very natural representation to classify stationary processes is to use the Fourier spectrum. 
The Fourier spectrum gets, if you implement it well, an error of the order of one person. And that was a little bit, that, that was basically the bottleneck of all techniques up to that point. So why one person? Because, and I'll show you examples, you may have textures which have exactly the same second order moments, but look completely different. And the Fourier transform cannot distinguish them because essentially it's based on second order moments. In this case, the error goes down to 0.2%. So by a big factor. And the question is why? why? What are we capturing when we are doing that? What kind of underlying models of stochastic processes we are building? So let me go back to stochastic process. Suppose that you have a process X, okay, which is stationary. What did we do? We took X and we made convolution with wavelets, different frequency bands. Took the modulus, and then the next layer is same thing, convolution with yet a new wavelet, modulus, third wavelets, and so on, for all possible wavelets. And at the end, we average all that with a filter. Now, if X is, has finite second order moments, what you can show is that when 2 to the j is going to go big, this is going to converge to a Gaussian vector, random vector, if you need some ergodicity decorrelation property. Now, when j goes to infinity, if you have a little bit of ergodicity property, this convolution, which is an averaging, you are making an averaging in time of a stationary process. It's going to converge to the expected value. So this vector is going to compute to a set of moments. So what you're really doing is you're representing your vector x, your stochastic process, by a set of moments which are not first order, first order, second, third order moments, which are moments obtained with contractive operators. Why is that important? Why nobody use high order moments to characterize random processes in classification? Because there's too much variability. When you compute a high order moment, you have a very dilating operators. The variability of your estimator gets very big. In this case, everything is contractive. So all these numbers, you can estimate them from a single realization with this averaging. OK, now you have your stochastic process, and you have a family of moments. In what sense can you describe your random process? Now, your random process is a priori described by a probability distribution. What do you know about the probability distribution of your process? Well, you know these expected values, okay? You have the expected values of x, expected values of x transformed by an operator u1, an operator u2, which gives you these coefficient, u3. So you know these expected values. In other words, you know the projection of your probability distribution on each of these transformed values. Now, the very natural thing to do, which has been described previously, is to compute the distribution which doesn't assume any other information, in other words, which has a maximum entropy. And if x is bounded in particular, but you can relax that, p of x is just going to be a Boltzmann distribution. It's an exponential distribution, which is a linear combination of the constraints. So you can compute p of x. And if the maximum entropy is the same than the entropy, so it's systematically going to be bigger than the, Trump, the entropy of the true probability distribution. But if it's of the same order, then you've been able to characterize your process. So let me show you an example. Mistake uh, uh, H to be the negative of the usual one, just to confuse us. Uh, e maximum entropy, they should be a minus. And they, yeah, no, it's a maximum entropy, it's a negative. It's always correct, but the notation is, is, uh, is the uh, H is... Uh, what? Uh, well, often, no, it's often negative. It's often, it's, it depends on the community. It's too, in probability, usually it's negative. Uh, but uh, with S. Oh, with S, yes. Okay, now, this is an example of texture. This is the model of such a texture with a Gaussian process. It's very good because this one is nearly Gaussian. This is what you would obtain with the scattering coefficient. I'm just going to get the first two layers of the network. First order wavelets and first order and second order wavelets. So very similar. Now look in that case. Here you have very highly non-Gaussian process with a lot of geometry. This is what a Gaussian process will give you. This is a realization obtained from these moments. 
And what you see is you capture the geometry because you have all the interaction between all scales, all angles. This is a third example. This is what you have. This is a realization of a Gaussian process. This is what you get with such a distribution. If you take turbulent, oh, that's not yet uh, turbulent. This is a very sparse process. These two processes have exactly the same second order moment. It's just to show you that second order moments, be aware. Okay, that's a Gaussian model. That's what you get with these models. And this is a turbulent signal. This is essentially a Kolmogorov model, Gaussian model. And that's what you get by imposing these kind of moments. And what you can see is that you are capturing something which is called intermittency, which is very naturally emerging from these networks. Let me show you the same thing with sounds. First sound. You're going to hear the sound having exactly the same second order moment. Gaussian model. And then what you get from the first two layers of the scattering. The Gaussian model. Scattering. Cocktail party. Gaussian model. Scattering. Obviously, you don't have the word, but you have the prosody. Now, does it work always? No. Let me show you another example. Scattering. You have a little bit, but you've lost a lot of things. Worse. I've been a Wikipedia editor since 2003, and I'm the founder of the... Getting pretty bad. Worse. What does it mean? You've lost a lot of the geometry of your signal. For now, we've just looked at translation, but there is much, much more geometry than just translation. If you think in the case of audio, you have structures, you have a harmonic structure. It's very well known that how do you describe naturally this harmonic structure? With a spiral, with octave. Because if you look at the first bass harmonic, it's going to appear here. The next one is one octave above, the next one is one third. This is the harmonic spiral that dates to Riemann, a different Riemann. Next one is one octave above. Here, the. And the very natural geometry that you want to look at this is on the spiral. So, how to deal with this? You want now to describe the variability on this spiral. So, you have to face new groups. And that's now what we're going to see which will explain why these networks get much more complex. I'm going to show that in a simpler case, which is images now. In an image, if you just apply what I described on this problem, you don't get 0.2%, you get 20% error. Why? Because there is a lot of variability of rotations, there is a lot of variability in scaling, and you didn't build any environment relatively to these things. So the problem now is that you want to increase the range of environment. You essentially want to be invariant to any arbitrary group. And we're Lie group. And we're now going to look at simply the group of translations and rotation, which is not so simple because it's not commutative, but still. You have a signal. And we are going to look at the impact of this group. If you just do what I did previously, is a convolution with a wavelet and the average, what's happening if you translate and rotate the signal? If you average, the average is not going to be changed. Good. That's an environment. If you look at the wavelet coefficients, they are going to be translated, and the index of the wavelet is also going to be translated. In other words, a rotation, you can view it as a translation on the circle. So to become invariant to rotation, you will need to become invariant to this translation along the rotation parameter. What that means? That means that your next wavelet should not just act on the translation group, but should act on the translation group, but also on the rotation group. So you're going to build a wavelet which is now living on your rigid movement group. And that we know well how to do. You can build wavelets on any groups. And you make a convolution relatively to your wavelet on your translation rotation group. And you reapply exactly the same thing. So you have your first wavelet transform. Initially, you just have translation. 
But now you see your rotation parameter, and now you do a convolution, a wavelet transform on the roto translation group or the region movement groups, and then you cascade. And now you're going to get your invariant. Now, if you do that on this problem, the error goes from 20% to 0.6%. Why? Because you've dealt with your source of variability. And that's the key problem in all these high dimensional problems. How to deal with the existing variability, build an invariant which is sufficiently rich to still preserve the information. Now, that kind of things have been used, and that's the work of Edouard Oyalon, for doing classification of objects. So that was the original database. You take your different objects, you now build a representation which is the capacity of being invariant to translation, but also rotations and potentially scaling. And then you build a simple linear classifier. How does that compare to the state of the art? State of the art are these deep networks. That's what we get here. They do better. The error here is 10%, the error here is 20%. However, if you look at this figure, 80% error, uh, sorry, 80% accuracy, that's on 200 classes, means that you've been able to capture pretty well the difference and the characteristic of each of these classes. What do they get more? That's the question. Obviously, they are able to learn all the types of groups which are important in this classification problem. And one of the key questions is to understand what's the nature of these environments that these people are able to learn through these deep networks. What I want is to finish on the physical problem because it will bring us back to things that we know in a different context. So in physics, the problem is the following. X now is the state of your system, okay? So if you have an n-body problem, uh, it's going to be the position and the value, the mass, or let's say the charge in the case of quantum chemistry. Now, typically, if you look at such a problem, you immediately see that there is potentially a huge explosion of interaction because if you have d particle, you potentially have d squared interactions. However, we well very know, sorry, we know well that you can reduce the number of interaction. There is the so-called multiple methods, which essentially is based on the following idea. If you want to look at the interaction of a particle and all the others, what you can do is first look at the interaction of a particle with its neighbor. And with the neighbors which are a little bit more far away, you can look at the interaction with the group, with some summary of the group with the neighbors which are even more far away, with an even bigger group. The equivalent is to say, for example, what's the impact of, let's say, a Russian in your life? If you take randomly a Russian in Russia, probably not much. But the impact of Russia as a whole in your life can be pretty large if there is political tension between France and Russia. So what is important for very far away structures in general is not so much each of the elements, but the aggregation. And the impact of that is that the number of interaction goes from d squared to log d squared. This is the idea of multiscale separation. Okay, quantum chemistry. In quantum chemistry, if you take, and you solve the Schrodinger equation, you are going to get the probability density of the electrons. And the electrons are going to define the chemical binding between the different atoms. So normally, to get the probability density of the electrons, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation, which is a very heavy numerical problem. So if you look at, you can state that as a variational problem. Basically, if you want to look at the probability density of the electron, it's going to have different kind of components. The component which is the repulsions between the electrons, the component which is the attraction between the electron and uh, the nucleus, and a very, very nonlinear component which carries most of the complicated terms, uh, nonlinear terms of the Schrodinger equation. Now, if you want to compute the true distribution, you are going to try to minimize the energy. 
to find the, the uh, if you have no external force, you are going to find the minimal energy which corresponds to the situation of your molecule in the ground state, which consists in finding the density which minimizes the energy. So that's the ultimate energy you want to compute. And in our case, what we want to do is to learn this energy. So what do we know about this energy? This energy is invariant to any rigid movement. You take a molecule, you rotate, translate it, the energy doesn't change. If you act with a diffeomorphism on your energy, you slightly deform the energy, the energy is going to slightly change. So you have a very similar problem to the image processing problem. So, what we're going to do is, in our case, we don't know this, at, this density which corresponds to the ideal minimal state because that requires to solve Schrodinger. We are going to begin with a very crude approximation of the density. What we say is that we know the position of each of the atom and we are going to consider each atom as being an isolated atom. So we neglect all interaction and that gives us an initial density completely different from the true density which really carries all the chemical bounds. And to perform the learning, we are going to transform this appropriate, approximate density and build a representation which is invariant to translation, invariant to rotation, and stable to diffeomorphism. So just to show you the comparison with a Fourier transform, I'm going to show you two representations, one with the scattering transform, the other one with the Fourier transform, which is made invariant of a rotation by an integration of our circles. And what we're going to do is learn the physical energy in a very naive way as a simple linear regression over these quantities. Okay, so we learn the, we expand the energy over our invariant descriptors. And what we're going to learn is the weights. And how do we learn the weight from the database of training coefficients? And we're going to try to learn a minimum number of coefficients. So it's a sparse number of variables. And I think that Francis described that kind of problem. Okay, so here's a situation. You have a database with molecule, you know the energy of each of the molecules. You now train the system so that you can regress the known values as a linear combination of your invariant. And then you test over a testing set, which are new molecules. And you look at the error as the function of the number of coefficients that you've used in the regression. So if you look at the Fourier transform invariant, basically it stops at 16 kilocalories per molecule. To give you an order of magnitude, if you run a DFT code, so a numerical code, the error is of the order of one kilocalorie per mole. If you just apply the first layer of the network, the error is of the same order, 14. If you include the second order coefficient, it jumps to 2.7 in that case. So you are not very far from what you can get numerically by solving Schrodinger equations. Now, obviously that also will depend upon the structure of the database, but these are databases that were put together by chemists. And what that indicates, and nowadays there is a lot of people that are going in this field, that it is indeed possible to directly learn physical functionals without solving the underlying uh, equations, but by getting directly invariants which looks appropriate. Now, why are these invariant appropriate? Because what you have here are things which decorrelate scales. Now, in physics, we know very well, forces are decorrelated across scale. In what sense? If you analyze a physical system, you can analyze the chemical bounds, which are very short scale, separate that from longer range interactions, such as van der Waals force, or even longer range interactions, which are typically the kind of thing which are done by these things. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, the first conclusion, which is a, a little bit global, is that from a mass point of view, all these learning problems, the main, main difficulty is to find appropriate ways to build metric with features, which are simple Euclidean metrics, which are similar to the original metric. So this is called a Euclidean embedding. 
And again, it's a relatively standard mathematical question, but in a totally different framework relatively to what this has been done before. And if you look at the problem from a probabilistic point of view, it's like building Gaussian models of completely non-Gaussian processes. Now, if you are in a situation where you want stability to the action of diffeomorphism, whether it's in space, whether it's along rotation, whether it's along frequencies, then you know you have to put wavelets. You don't have the choice. You need to separate scales, so your filters will be wavelets. Now, you are in two situations. Either you are in the situation like the one I described, where you know the geometry, you know that you want to deal with translation, rotation, whatever, and then you can automatically build up your operator. But many problems in learning, you don't know the geometry. You don't know what is the source of variability, how to capture it, how to build the environment, and that's where you need to learn. And this is a completely open field, mathematically and also algorithmically. There's a lot of very beautiful results algorithmically around that, and very little mathematical understanding. Uh, from, I insist on the physical problem because I think that this is going to have a, a pretty strong influence in physics. It is now possible to build up models in physics and more and more refine directly from data. So it's a completely different approach to building models of energy functionals. And so there are all kinds of applications. I spoke here about audio and images. Another very interesting domain where these kind of things have been applied is natural language. To classify ex with exactly the same algorithm. You take a text, and a very beautiful uh, paper did the following thing. Each letter, you have 26 letters plus uh, the comma, point, and blank, is coded with one digit between 1 and 30. You get a big signal, okay, which is meaningless. You send that in your neural net, and they got state-of-the-art classification of problems such as sentiment analysis, whether the text is sad, not sad, topic analysis, whether it's about chemistry, math, whatever, and so on. How do they do that? Training on a huge amount of data. What are the underlying environments? No idea. What is built, I don't know. But the results are very spectacular, and that's raising very nice questions. Thanks very much. So thanks a lot for uh, your question. Uh, it's, it's more a curiosity. So how can you, oh, so, okay. If you want to learn physics from the data, you limit yourself uh, to the available data, to the quality of the data that you have, right? So to me, it's, um, a the question is, where does it break down? I mean. Exactly there. But that's the standard procedures. I mean. Physics, what is the normal procedure in research in physics? You have experimental people who are doing measurements, and several centuries afterwards, you have people like Newton, like uh, Maxwell, like Einstein, which puts together all these numerical experiments and try to find out a theory which summarizes it. There is no way you can build a, a complete theory without having experimental data verifying it at one point. Well, you can try to extrapolate like string theory, but at one point you'll need to verify it with data. It's the same thing. This kind of thing can only learn in the region of the space where you do have data. Yeah, you can do experiment design yeah. based on the model. Yeah. Right? And in this way, instead, is, uh, I construct the model based on the data that I have. Sorry, I don't understand in what sense you design the experiments as a function of the model. Well, if you have a physical model, you know how you should uh, get the data, like the sample rate and... Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you're right. You need to have some prior information to get the range of results of what you get and so on. But a lot also of experiments can be carried without any theory, and in particular in, ma in material science, where you have amazingly complex system with very long range interaction, very complicated, people know how to make measurements. But the difficulty is to predict the behavior of the resulting material. So we are, that kind of, in material science, 
<laughs> you are in a situation where you can do that kind of thing. The limitation currently is that these techniques are not yet precise enough. But you have people in, in chemical companies, for example, who are working on that kind of thing now because they have huge amount of molecules to screen to try to see whether they have a chance to be stable or not before doing actually the chemical experiments. They do that normally with computational uh, tools, but it's often too slow, and now they're trying that kind of technique. So, yeah, that's... Uh... Yes, so, uh, we question. You showed us examples about images and examples about sound. You mentioned uh, images uh, somehow is simpler than, than sound in some sense. And when you gave the applications, you also had the, there was a feeling that it worked less good on some issues like uh, uh, like speech, like uh, uh, musical instruments, and so on. Although uh, sound is a one-dimensional signal and the image is a two-dimensional, uh, what is it in our uh, why would you, how would you explain the fact that sound uh, causes some tricky... Uh, okay, I wouldn't say that sound is more uh, complicated. If you take the state of the art right now of speech analysis, uh, it's using these kind of techniques, deep networks. So they, they do have the state of the art for musical analysis, speech analysis. Uh, I didn't describe because we didn't work specifically on this. Uh, now, whether sound is more complicated than image is a very complicated. You know, a priori doesn't mean anything. You have two functions, whether it's in R2 or in R. It's, a, it's the same thing. It depends on the nature of the underlying process. Sounds has an amazing amount of richness. And in fact, you can obviously make an image out of the sound. You compute the time frequency transform. You immediately have an image. Uh, whether one is more... Uh, I would say, in terms of technology, state-of-the-art, what works the best right now is speech analysis. And you have it in your uh, telephone. It now works uh, pretty well. Uh, images is not at that level, in the sense that we begin, image analysis begins to work well, but the difficulty, images are much richer than speech. Now, if you go from speech to music and any kind of sound, then it, gets, it has the complexity of images. And then there is the same kind of thing. What I wanted to show is that even in sound, you have much more complex groups than just translation. But then let's go back to, to this uh, again. Because also, if we have uh, there is some conversation, then if all the conversation is shifted uh, by a slight amount, we still recognize it, even if it's not octave or whatever. If uh, some people speak uh, louder or so, we still see recognize and so on. So it seems to me that there are a lot, uh, even more uh, invariants than uh, what you described. No, but the spiral is continuous. So uh, when, you, when you move on the spiral, if you just shift a little bit, you move a little bit on the spiral. Mm. The, the spiral is not discrete. It's a, it, you have, have two-dimensional topology. You have the, the topology like that and you have the, the topology uh, vertical. And so that, that carries uh, that kind of thing. That's why, in fact, very naturally, people, music is written with octaves. And with a musical score, you can have a lot of richness. But very naturally, music is organized with do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. So you have the spiral and you have the octave. Why? Because it's a way to capture the topology of the harmonics. Now, at the same time, you can have a very slight move of the frequency. That's what happens when you go from, let's say, do to do dies, uh, re, and so on. You can move very progressively. So, but, and it was a, an example, but I think there are even much, much more complicated structures. That's what seems to be captured by these networks. We are right now working with relatively simple groups. Even the, the spiral groups is not so complicated. So, and that's why, where again, I think there is a lot of richness for math, is that the type of transformation that we see appearing in these networks, we have a very hard time to understand that. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, is, is it possible to know the number of layers one needs for a specific problem? And uh, these deep networks, how, how many layers are okay. there? Okay, in what I 
killed by my Okay, in what I described, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. in what I described, uh, the depth is basically scale. As you go, and that's in general what these depths means, because when you go to bigger and bigger depths, you are getting descriptors of larger and larger structure, which are very rich. And now, what's happening is that there are different ways to structure the, uh, the filters in these networks. So some network announced that they have 20 layers, some others have seven, some have 10, but it very much depends on how they computed their filters and so on. If you have to think of depths again, think of it of what is going to be the scale of the descriptors you want. And if you think, for example, of an image, if you want to recognize very large structure, like, for example, the fact that you have an auditorium here, you want to capture very large scale. So you want to go pretty deep. If you want to deal with speech and you are interested in capturing whole sentence, you want to go to very large scale. So that's going to depend. The depth is going to depend upon the maximum scale which is important for your recognition problem. So uh, when you apply your sketch to uh, real images and you get 80% uh, correct uh, classification and 20% wrong classification, can you look at those 20% to try to figure out what kind of invariance you're missing out? That's what uh, so this PhD student, Edouard, is, uh, is doing. But we are hitting a kind of wall in the sense that all the useful group that, uh, all the groups that we're used to don't seem to allow us to penetrate these last 20% in these cases and they are able to do it. So right now we are facing a thing, we don't understand uh, what allows to go beyond. And there has been also a phenomena, in the case of learning, there is two types of learning. There is so-called unsupervised learning, so people who learn without the labels, and the people who learn with knowing the labels. Unsupervised learning is not able, seems, to penetrate these last 20%. So it looks like it not only describes the structure of the data, but the structure of the data in relation with the world of the labels. But as I said, I, we, that's what we are trying to do, but right now, we, and they do that, with, what is for me very spectacular, they do that on millions of images. These techniques, what is impressive is that they scale. And it's the first time, when, what I mean by the scale is that if you have very, very large database, their accuracy continue to increase, which is relatively new. We didn't have that kind of things before. Maybe a question. So you, you seem always to start with one image and one type of one cat, for yeah. example, and then you try to understand all the possible cats from one. But in real life, you have uh, thousands of images of cats. So can, would it be useful to start from the information that you have with thousands of oh, But that's what we do. That's what we do. When, when I, I, as I said, uh, even in our framework, the last classifier is working out of training data. And in the training data, you don't have one cat you have several hundred or thousands of cats. If you just have one cat, there is no way you can do it because you can't learn the variability. So you do, you, yeah, yeah, you absolutely need thousands of cats to recognize cats. Okay, so, so maybe we should thank all the speakers from today. I think it was really uh, amazing talks. And uh, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot.